Welcome everybody and thank you for joining us for this service of worship, word and sacrament on this, the fifth Sunday in Lent. I do pray that as we engage this morning with God, we will all be truly blessed. Looking at the parish in the coming week, the birthdays are as follows. Today, March the 21st, Debbie Barry. March the 24th, Julia Westerby Naidu and Joshua Cooper. March the 25th, Peter Maseko. March the 26th, Mark von Weimarisch. March the 27th, Doreen also. We do wish you all a very happy birthday and pray that the year ahead will be filled with God's abundant blessings. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. We have come together as the family of God in our Father's presence to offer Him praise and thanksgiving, to hear and receive His holy word, to bring before Him the needs of the world, to ask His forgiveness of our sins, and to seek His grace, that through His Son Jesus Christ, we may give ourselves to his service. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So let us confess our sins against God and our neighbour. Most Holy and Merciful Father, we confess to you and to one another and to the whole communion of saints in heaven and on earth that we have sinned by our own fault in thought, word and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. 
We have not loved you with our whole heart and mind and strength. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We have not forgiven others as we have been forgiven. Have mercy on us, O Lord. We confess to you, Lord, all our past unfaithfulness, the selfishness, hypocrisy, and impatience of our lives. Hear our confession, O Lord. Our self-indulgent appetites and ways, and our exploitation of other people. Hear our confession, O Lord. Our apathy and indifference, and our acceptance of oppression. Hear our confession, O Lord. Accept our repentance, Lord, for the wrongs we have done, for our blindness to human need and suffering, and our indifference to injustice and cruelty. Hear our confession, O Lord. For our waste and pollution of your creation, and our lack of concern for those who come after us, accept our repentance, O Lord. Restore us, good Lord, and let your anger depart from us. Favorably hear us, for your mercy is great. Accomplish in us the work of your salvation, that we may show forth your glory in the world. By the cross and passion of your Son, our Lord, bring us with all your saints to the joy of Christ's resurrection. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. The Collect for the Fifth Sunday in Lent. Let us pray. God of suffering and glory, in Jesus Christ you reveal the way of life. Inscribe your law on our hearts, that we may not stray from you, but remain your faithful people. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Old Testament reading comes from the book of Jeremiah, chapter 31, Verses 31 to 34. The Lord says, The time is coming when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the old covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand and led them out of Egypt. Although I was like a husband to them, they did not keep that covenant. The new covenant that I will make with the people of Israel will be this. I will put my law within them and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. None of them will have to teach his fellow countrymen to know the Lord because all will know me from the least to the greatest. I will forgive their sins and I will no longer remember their wrongs. I, the Lord, have spoken. Hear the word of the Lord. Psalm 51, verses 1 to 12. Have mercy on me, O God, in your enduring goodness. According to the fullness of your compassion, blot out my offences. Wash me thoroughly from my wickedness, and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my rebellion, and my sin is ever before me. Against you only have I sinned, and done what is evil in your eyes, so you will be just in your sentence, and blameless in your judging. Surely in wickedness I was brought to birth, and in sin my mother conceived me. You that desire truth in the inward parts, O teach me wisdom in the secret places of the heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. 
Make me hear of joy and gladness. Let the bones which you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Do not cast me out from your presence. Do not take your Holy Spirit from me. O oh, give me the gladness of your help again, and support me with a willing spirit. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. The second reading comes from Hebrews chapter 5 verses 5 to 10. In the same way, Christ did not take upon himself the honor of being a high priest. Instead, God said to him, You are my son. Today I have become your father. He also said in another place, You will be a priest forever in the line of succession to Melchizedek. In his life on earth, Jesus made his prayers and requests with loud cries and tears to God who could not save him from death. Because he was humble and devoted, God heard him. But even though he was God's son, he learned through his sufferings to be, to, to be obedient. When he was made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. And God declared him to be high priest in the line of succession to Melchizedek. Hear the word of the Lord. The Gospel reading. Listen to the good news proclaimed in the Gospel according to St. John, chapter 12, beginning to read at the 20th verse. Now there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the feast. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, with a request. Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. Philip went to tell Andrew. Andrew and Philip, in turn, told Jesus. Jesus replied, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. I tell you the truth, unless an ear of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. The man who loves his life will lose it, while the man who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be. My Father will honour the one who serves me. Now my heart is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven, I have glorified it, and will glorify it again. The crowd that was there had heard it and said it had thundered. Others said an angel had spoken to him. Jesus said, This voice was for your benefit, not mine. Now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. But I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. He said this to show the kind of death he was going to die. This is the Gospel of Christ. As we move closer and closer to the events of Holy Week and the final days and hours of the life of Jesus, we begin to get caught up in the life-changing events that took place. We've now come to the fifth Sunday in Lent, and next week we'll be celebrating the triumphal entry of Jerusal into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. But I think it's also all too easy to get swept up in the emotion of the season and to lose focus of the price that was paid for what has been achieved for us. Today we are presented with a glimpse of what God achieved for us through his Son, Jesus Christ, but also the incredible cost that was paid on our behalf. We are shown how only Jesus could fulfill the role of that perfect sacrifice 
made once for all. We are shown how much of a sacrifice it was for the human Jesus to willingly submit to the will of his Father and to commit himself to the final leg of his journey through life. We are also shown why this was so necessary for us. We are shown how this commitment calls for death in order for there to be life in abundance, because in the kingdom of God there cannot be any glory without suffering or some form of sacrifice. Each one of us is called to question our own commitment to this kingdom. Each one of us is called to make a decision about the future direction of our life. No one else can make this decision for us. It is our burden to bear. Our passage this morning from Jeremiah is a very well-known one, which speaks of the transformation of God's people on the inside, with God writing his law on his people's hearts, inviting his people into a personal relationship with God. The passage appears in the so-called Book of Comfort at the heart of the Book of Jeremiah, which includes chapters 30 to 33. These moving visions of restoration and renewal appear after 29 chapters of harsh condemnation of Judah's values and institutions. In these previous prophecies, Jeremiah is enraged at life in Jerusalem, practiced in the temple and in the palace, in the courts and in private homes, amounts to fundamental betrayal of God and the covenant their ancestors made at Sinai. Jeremiah accuses the elite of the city of watering down and corrupting the stipulations of the covenant made at Sinai. He accuses them of social injustices and turning away from Yahweh. Faced with a Babylonian invasion, the elite of Judah place their faith in military strategy and political alliances rather than in the radical free God revealed to the ancestors at Sinai. The covenant made at Sinai is not the problem. The problem is the dilution of Judah's covenant identity. The Sinai covenant known to us from Exodus was formed in the wilderness between the slaves newly liberated from Egypt and the God of their ancestors, who they themselves only meet for the first time when Moses arrives with the God-given message to Pharaoh, Let my people go. The covenant is rooted in God's defining act of liberation. That act was an act of freedom. But being able to experience the fullness of God's blessing depends on the people's willingness to respond to God with their whole lives. These people are set apart for holiness to God, and God intends for them to be an instrument of blessing to the whole earth. Therefore, the covenant seeks to form a community that is held to high ethical and religious standards, which include the enactment of fierce loyalty to and complete reliance on God, and the cultivation of a culture of justice and shalom, or peace, for all. Jeremiah depicts the monarchy as corrupt, and the religious authorities in the temple as hypocritical. As a prophet, Jeremiah himself is ostracized, and many people ignore and mock his message. His poetic ideal of the new covenant addresses a problem with the way in which the covenant is given and received. Therefore, Jeremiah's new covenant cuts out the middleman and mediating institutions. You see, he envisions a divine human relationship untarnished by authorities and powers. The new covenant will no longer be entrusted to the elite. Rather, it will be inscribed on in the heart of each individual. Hierarchies will have no place in this future. We read in verse 34, No longer shall they teach one another or say to each other, Know the Lord, for they shall all know him. The new covenant also serves to minimize external differences between members of the community. The covenant being written on the heart has a leveling effect. All community members now stand on equal ground, in equal righteousness. The internal marker of the covenant binds the community together with an invisible sign that cannot be questioned by genealogy or undermined with accusations of purity. No one can claim the authority to teach the other, because each heart has God's law inscribed on it. 
hope for the future in Jeremiah involves the same divine message known from Sinai. I will be their God and they will be my people. But this time, that covenant relationship will be the defining mark of each person carried in their hearts rather than something that must be earned. This is a huge transformation. So, from Jeremiah bemoaning the inadequacies of the religious leaders and their failure to properly teach and guide God's people, we move on to the ultimate example of our great high priest that we see depicted in Hebrews and the Gospel. The writer of Hebrews shows us this morning that Jesus perfectly fulfills and exceeds the qualifications for being our great high priest. The author shows here how Jesus not only fulfilled the requirements for the Aaronic priesthood, but exceeded them by being a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Verses 5 and 6 are quotes from two messianic psalms, the first being Psalm 2 verse 7. He said to me, You are my son, today I have begotten you. And the second from Psalm 110 verse 4, You are a priest forever, after the order of Melchizedek. Even though the Christ is the Son of God, in a unique relationship with the Father, he did not glorify himself by taking the office of high priest for himself. Rather, God designated him as such, and not just a priest in the limited human sense of the Aaronic, Aaronic priests, but a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. The son's exalted position is to sit at the father's right hand in the place of sovereign rule. In this Messiah, the offices of king and priest are united, as he is designated a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. The point of the two quotations is to show that Jesus did not presume to take the office of high priest by his own authority, but God appointed him to this place. We are also shown in verses 7 and 8 in Hebrews how Jesus identifies with us through the way in which he suffered and learned obedience to his Father. We see through this that Jesus can sympathize with our weaknesses because he has been tempted in all things as we are, yet is without sin. Similar to the Levitical priests, Jesus could identify with the weaknesses of the people. But, unlike these priests, he had no sin of his own. Verse 7 especially points to Jesus' agony in the Garden of Gethsemane as he wrestled with the imminent prospect of taking our sins upon himself. Jesus' intense struggle in the Garden was not just over the thought of the physical agony of crucifixion. Rather, he was struggling with the thought of being separated from the Father as he bore our sin. You see, in the same way that the temple curtain would be ripped in two, Jesus' relationship with his Father would be ripped in two. This was so intense that we are told that he literally sweat blood in that garden. The writer of Hebrews shows us that even though Jesus is fully God and the cross was central to God's predetermined plan for salvation, the actual implementation of that plan was not easy. Jesus was not just play-acting a role here. Jesus' suffering in the garden and on the cross was more intense than we can ever imagine. Jesus learned obedience in the sense that he experienced what obedience means through what he suffered. He was always obedient to the Father's will, but the proof of obedience is revealed in situations where obedience is not pleasant. For example, suppose that when my sons were younger, I told you, I've got very obedient kids. Let me prove it to you. And I asked them, kids, eat your ice cream. You would say to me, that's absolutely no test of obedience. Everybody loves ice cream. The real test, however, would be if I said, boys, go clean your rooms. Jesus experienced obedience to the maximum when he went to the cross. The author's point is that Jesus is our perfect high priest, in that his prayers and obedience through his sufferings show that he can sympathize with us in our sufferings. Therefore, we should obediently persevere in trials through prayer. 
through his suffering and sacrifice for us. Jesus becomes the source of eternal salvation to all who believe in him and obey him. Eternal salvation here is contrasted with the temporary nature of the Old Testament sacrifices, which could never make perfect those who offer them. The cause of our salvation is not that God foresee, foresaw what we would believe. The cause of our salvation is that the triune God chose us in him before the foundation of the world. God first loved us. Jesus became the cause of salvation to all those who obey him. This is not teaching salvation by works. Rather, to have saving, saving faith is to obey Jesus who commanded, repent and believe in the gospel. I'd like to end this morning with a few points that we can take from today's readings. First of all, if our sin is so hideous, that God required nothing less than the death of his perfect sinless Son as the only solution, then we are foolish if we think that any of our human solutions would be good enough. Any system of salvation by good works trashes Christ's death as unnecessary. Why did he have to offer up loud crying and tears if we are inherently good enough to get into heaven? Why did Jesus have to suffer and die if we can be saved by our own efforts. Secondly, if God's wrath and anger against sin is so dreadful, then we actually need to run to the cross for refuge daily, and we need to live our lives with gratitude that Jesus took our sins to the cross. Thirdly, obedient faith is the only faith that saves us. We are saved by faith alone, apart from works, but the kind of faith that saves necessarily results in good works. As James says in chapter 2, the one who says that he has faith but has no works is deceiving himself. We should be as devoted to God and his will as Jesus was, no matter what the cost. Fourthly, prayer and obedient faith are inextricably linked. Jesus prayed in the garden so that he could obey on the cross. Prayer and obedience are inextricably linked. He said to his disciples, Pray that you may not enter into temptation. We must follow Jesus in his prayer life if we wish to follow him in his obedience to the Father. And lastly, God's love for us does not prevent us from going through trials. The Father loved the Son, and yet the cross was his destiny. He loves us and yet brings us to glory through many sufferings. John Piper says, No one ever said that they learned their deepest lessons of life, or had their sweetest encounters with God on the sunny days. People go deep with God when the drought comes. You see, we need a high priest. We need a bridge builder between us and God, because God is infinitely holy, and we are sinners. Jesus Christ is that bridge. He is that high priest. We need to turn to him for salvation and to live daily at the foot of the cross. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, your faithful love surrounds us and we give you thanks for the gift of life and the gift of new life and for the many ways you sustain and nurture us. We come before you today, some of us tired and hungry, looking for your word to sustain us, your spirit to comfort us. Some of us come bruised and sore, looking for healing, longing for wholeness. Some of us come despairing, wondering what has happened and where the joy of life has gone. Some of us come with heavy hearts, praying for young people harmed by those who should protect them, praying for those who look different and so are treated as being less worthy. We are praying for a world on edge, tense with fear and hate and violence. 
We come looking for good news in the midst of the world's bad news. We come seeking forgiveness for our wrongs, seeking to know your presence when we feel so alone, seeking to know your heart and will for a world with so much need. In the silence of our hearts, we offer you our prayers and we listen for yours. Let your grace rain down on us, O God. May we be surrounded by your love, your peace, your hope. Open our eyes and our hearts to see you in unexpected places. Guide our hands to show your love, not only to those close and dear to us, but especially to the stranger. You are a God of surprises, a God of peace, a God of hope, a God of love. Fill us with your Spirit and give us the strength and courage that we may widen the circle until all the world knows your grace. We pray these and the silent prayers of our hearts in the loving name of Jesus Christ. Amen. You are all invited now to join in the celebration of the sacrament of the Holy Eucharist. Blessed are you, Lord, God of all creation. Through your goodness we have this bread to offer, which earth has given and human hands have made. For us it becomes the bread of life. Blessed be God forever. Blessed are you, Lord, God of all creation. Through your goodness we have this wine to offer, fruit of the vine and work of human hands. For us it becomes the cup of salvation. Blessed be God forever. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Worship and praise belong to you, maker of light and darkness. Your wisdom draws beauty from chaos, brings a harvest out of sorrow, calls out to those who have lost their way, and leads them safely home. God of grace and glory, you made us, you seek and find us, we are your own. In Christ your Son, enemies are reconciled, debts forgiven, and strangers are made welcome. 
Your Spirit frees us to live as sons and daughters, secure in your family. We who by Christ's power seek to follow the way of the cross, sharing the joy of Christ's obedience, now offer you our praise with angels and archangels and the whole company of heaven, singing the hymn of your unending glory. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Glory and thanksgiving are yours, most loving and gracious God, for Jesus Christ in whom the world is reconciled. He is the Lamb of God who takes away our sin and gathers us into the abundant new life of your forgiveness. Lifted on the cross, his suffering and forgiveness span the gulf our sins had made. Through Christ's dark struggle, death is shadowed in victory. Christ the firstborn freely offered himself as the Passover lamb for the sins of the whole world. By his loving sacrifice, he inaugurates the reign of eternal light and abundant life. By his blood, he reconciled us. By his wounds, we are healed. Before he was given up to suffering and death, at a meal recalling the night of Israel's Passover release, Jesus took bread and offered you thanks. He broke the bread and gave it to his friends, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, it is broken for you, do this to remember me. After supper he took the cup, again he offered you thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you, this is my blood of the new covenant. It is poured out for you and for all, that all sin may be forgiven. Do this to remember me. We now obey your Son's command. We recall Christ's passion and death. We celebrate Christ's resurrection. We look for the coming of Christ's kingdom. Made one with him, we offer you these gifts. With them we offer ourselves a single, holy, living sacrifice. Hear us, most merciful Father, and send your Holy Spirit upon us and upon the bread and wine we offer, that, overshadowed by his life-giving power, they may be the body and blood of your Son. By your grace, open our ears to hear you calling us home. Arouse in our hearts the desire to, to return to you, and kindle within us the fire of your love that renews us for the service of Christ's kingdom. Help us to live and work to your praise and glory. Make us grow together in unity and love until at last your creation is renewed and restored. Then bring us with Mary, the mother of our Lord, and all the hosts of heaven to our true eternal home where we may praise you forever. Risen Lord, be known to us in the breaking of the bread. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom, and with whom, and in whom, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honour and glory be to you, Lord of all ages, world without end. Amen. As Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father in heaven, Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against you. Save us from the time of trial, 
and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The bread which we break, is it not a sharing of the body of Christ? We who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. Come to this table, not because we must, but because we may. Not to testify that we are righteous, but that we sincerely love our Lord Jesus Christ and desire to be his true disciples. Not because we are strong, but because we need strength. Not because we have any claim on heaven's rewards, but because in our frailty and sin, we stand in constant need of heaven's mercy and help. The gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. The body of Christ broken for us. Amen. The blood of Christ shed for us. Amen. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. God's mercies never come to an end. Almighty God, you have given your only Son to be for us a sacrifice for sin and also an example of godly life. As you have fed us in this sacrament, so give us thankful hearts to receive the grace of this Holy Communion and eager wills to follow in Christ's blessed footsteps. In his tender mercy's sake. Amen. Father Almighty, we offer ourselves to you as a living sacrifice in Jesus Christ our Lord. Send us out into the world in the power of the Holy Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. God bless Africa. Protect our children. Transform our leaders. Heal our communities, restore our dignity, and give us peace. For Jesus Christ's sake. Amen. May Christ our Lord give you grace to grow in holiness, to deny yourselves, to take up your cross, and to follow him. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, be among you and remain with you always. Amen.
So let us go forth into the world following the path of Christ. In the name of Christ. Amen. Now found of every blessing Tune my heart to sing thy grace Streams of mercy never ceasing Call for songs of loudest praise Teach me some melodious sonnet Sung by flaming tongues above Praise the mountain Fixed upon it, mount of thy redeeming light. Here I raise mine Ebenezer, hither by thy help I'm come, and I hope by thy good pleasure. Safely to arrive at home Jesus saw me when a stranger Wandering from the fold of God He to rescue me from danger Interposed His precious blood To grace, how great a debtor Daily I'm constrained to be Let thy grace, Lord, like a fetter Bind my wandering heart to me Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it Prone to leave the God I love Here's my heart, Lord can seal it, seal it for thy courts above. Prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, Lord. Take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. Here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it, seal it for thy courts of